Grice, and welcome to my workshop. Just back from the big box store, got some one and a quarter inch screws. That's a little unusual size for me, but we've got some real applications for them. We're gonna be looking at rails, getting those in place, and we need to find a way to stitch up these two carcasses together. Finally, I think it's time to assemble those doors, and those are gonna be fun. So let's get inside, there's plenty to do. A bathroom vanity. Rails, tenons, and doors. Oh my. Well, good morning. Today, we're going to start with the vanities. As we said in last episode, we're still waiting on ammonia. So we're gonna focus our efforts here. Now recall there are three carcasses. This one right here is for the sink. It's got two doors that open up, plenty of storage underneath. And we've got two more right here that are gonna have four drawers a piece for a total of eight. Plenty of storage in those. Now, these have to be assembled in the upstairs room. They're just too heavy and too large to carry up that narrow winding staircase. So we're gonna keep them in three pieces, but they have to align perfectly because the rails that go across must line up. These are inset drawers. The overlays will illustrate any misalignment completely. So we have to be able to assemble them here, disassemble them, and assemble them upstairs with precision. Now we're gonna use screws on that. We're gonna use a screw going in this way. This is a one and a quarter and a, com and a contrasting screw on the other side so that we have two going in each way. We'll have front top, front back, and two under the toe kick so that we get a very, very solid alignment. Now we're gonna be using a bit with a countersink and I have adjusted the countersink such that it will not go all the way through. So let's go ahead and get started on this. All the rails are cut to second dimension. We want to go to final. The first step is to the jointer. That way we can get a good square edge on one side and then we'll take it to the table saw to get parallel from there. The most accurate mark you can make is the one you don't have to measure. We'll complete final dimension of the table saw. Well, I've got a slip fit here, but I'll go ahead and back it up with the clamp. I don't want it to move. But when do I get what I want? This was an issue, but it was not insurmountable. It just means we have to cut the door to fit a little differently than we would have otherwise. We'll never get the hole back in the right place, so it's not even really worth trying. We'll go ahead and put the screw in, but we will make the mental note. It has to be fixed later. It's very important these rails line up right. There's a technique for doing that that's really very effective. Let me show you how that's done. To index the rails, we're gonna use spacer sticks and we're gonna index those against the top rail. We'll put the new rail in place and then use an F clamp to secure it. It may seem like belt and suspenders, but we'll go ahead and clamp it on the sides as well. You can probably eyeball this and you might get it right, but you might get it wrong too. I usually choose to make my marks, that removes all doubt. With regards to the pilot hole, I generally do eyeball it, but I try hard to make sure it's square. Now you get to take it apart to apply a little glue. But the good news is you don't have to put the clamps back in place. Now that the screw holes are drilled, when you put the screws back in, it'll find its way to the right place. Well, these two rails have gone in very well. I'm very happy with that. They line up great. And it's no surprise because they were both indexed against these two sticks. Now I've got this one and then this one up here goes all the way across. So all I'll do is trim these to the next dimension and use them again. Well, our rails came out very nice. Everything's even, everything's level, everything's lining up just right. So I think we've got a good foundation to work forward. Let's talk construction sequence. We are not ready yet to start looking at drawers or doors. And the reason for that is quite simple. We are going to need to put in a fake leg, four of them, one, two, three, four, to hide the plywood edge. Now, that allows us to take this up in components, 
assemble them, and then apply those legs after the fact to give the illusion of a single piece of furniture. It's going to work out well. But the problem is that those legs are not one and a half inches thick. They're going to be proud a little bigger. And if they're a little bigger, I cannot size drawers or doors until I know where those are going to be. Additionally, because it is wider, I'm going to have to put some shimming on the sides of these cabinets in order to make up the difference. That is to help out with the drawer door hinges and the drawer slides. So the first step in this process, this sequence, is we need to make the legs. And I've got a very nice piece of quarter sawn right here. And it is at least three quarters of an inch. And we don't need that. I'm looking for a quarter of an inch because that's about all the reveal, all the proud that you would want on any piece of furniture where you were doing a mortise and tenon type construction. So we're going to take this to the bandsaw. We're going to resaw it. Then we're going to take it down to two inches, try to get rid of as much of this sapwood as possible, and we'll start forming up our legs. I don't care how good a blade you have on your bandsaw, and I have a good one, it's still going to leave marks. Marks that need to be milled out. Now this is quarter of an inch, it's too narrow really for a planer. So we're going to take this the drum sander and get it leveled out and sanded down. Well we sanded them down and they've come out really nice. You can't find any of the bandsaw marks on there at all. We're in good shape and we're still maintaining better than quarter of an inch so I'm happy with that. Now we cut all these boards to two inches and when I looked at it I did have some burning on one inch so I took it to the jointer and as you would expect when you resaw things you get a little movement and we had a couple of boards that had to go through the jointer twice to get a good clean cut. So with that in mind now that I know that I don't have even surfaces anymore. In other words, I've got different thicknesses. We're going to come back to the planer and we're going to clean that up. Now, the only real way to do that is to take these and gang them up. And I put a clamp on front and on back. We're set at two inches. We probably won't get any planing on the first pass, but second pass, maybe. We're going to sneak up on this. You can't put something as thin as three eighths of an inch through a planer. It will tip, it will skip. But if you gang up on them like this, you can make it work. It goes without saying that you do not want that metal clamp to touch the blades. Keep it low. I've been taking some time to lay out my joinery, and I want to use a through tenon, a fake through tenon, right here and right here. And I have sketched it out on both pieces so that I can see that. Now, that doesn't secure this to the cabinet. So I'm going to pre-drill for a screw here and a screw here and similar screws down on the bottom. Now the tenon, the fake tenon is going to cover that up, but the first step is to get the drills, the holes drilled for the screws and we're going over to the drill press to do that. We got four legs and we need to be pretty precise with where we drill our holes and that's where having some stops in place can really help. The bit that I was using had a countersink, but I didn't use it. Indexing against the fence allowed me to drill from both sides of the wood. I want my countersinks from only one side, so I'll use a countersinking bit and freehand the holes. The laser will help me get close. Well, I've made a sketch of what I want my fake tenon to look like, and uh, it's nothing much, but it doesn't need to be much. It just needs to be a guideline. Now, I have some stock milled up here. It's just a little bit better than one inch. And this is going to be fine for what we want to do. But in order to take this piece of stock right here to four fake tenons is a little bit of an issue. You have to have a construction sequence that supports minimal tool resets. And that's one of the things that I want to talk about right now. I've got a table saw right here that I'm going to be with my dado stack in it. And I have my belt sander just over there, and I have my chop saw behind you there. Those are the three tools we're going to be using to make these faux tenons. And in order to achieve accuracy, we want to have as few tool resets as possible. So we're going to be making good use of the anchor jig, and we are going to be making a lot of cuts. It may not seem like they 
mean anything, but they will all come together in the end. So let me show you the construction sequence that I have in mind. Two things to note here. One, oak chips out terribly. It really, really stinks. And second, I have my anchor jig calculated so I can tell what the measurements are. So I will calibrate this by moving the fence and that way I can keep all my measurement accuracy on these right here. These first four cuts are actually the basis for the tenon that will slip into the fake leg. Accuracy is maintained by keeping pressure against the stop at the end of the fence. This is the first of several tool resets. The depth of the tenon is actually not equal distance around the perimeter. We actually go deeper on the narrow sides. This is necessary because we have to have enough space to cover the screws. With the dado raised, we're ready to make the cuts on the long side of the tenons. With a little bit of effort, we make the adjustment and we're ready to cut the next set. That's the power of having a jig where repeatable measures are the focus. I've pulled out the dado stack and I've replaced it with my standard blade. I've set the angle at 45 degrees and moved my fence to the other side. This is to make the taper for the end of the tenon. Well, you're probably looking at this thinking, that looks kind of strange, and it does. I've got all my dados cut. Now, when I cut the top of this off and take that piece off, this piece right there, that's what's going to fit into the little square hole in the leg to keep it aligned perfectly, and that, that's, that's important. Also, I started doing my bevels, and you notice that this one is stepped. The first time I did this, I had a little bit too much of the flat. It didn't look quite right to me, so I took it back a little bit. And once I got it where I wanted it, everything here is spaced in one and a half inch increments. So I merely take my, my uh, measure here, and I step it up in one and a half inch increments and make the next cut. Now, the blue tape. The blue tape has been doing a fantastic job of keeping my dados just perfectly clear. Now, that is a mistake right there, and it's okay. That was a little bit of complacency. So, and, and I'll show you that. That happens when you don't get on that little edge just right. I was a little high and a little back, and the cut was made wrong. Fortunately, I have extra, and it's not going to become a problem. Getting back to the tape. The tape was causing... It was the saw blade was forcing it into the pores, creating a little bit of a blue tinge. And I haven't seen that before. This was new, but generally I use brown masking tape. So maybe it's been there all along and I haven't noticed. But in this case, I've decided to take the tape off and I am not getting any chip out on these corners. And that is fantastic. So I'm going to step this thing forward in one and a half inch increments and then I'm going to do the other one. Then we're going to start cutting the tops and the bottoms of these off. I'll show you that next. Once we get the jig set, we cut the top off. At the miter saw, we will go ahead and put a stop in place. That helps to ensure an accurate cut. Well, a lot of steps and a lot of effort, but this is what I'm going for. It's amazing, all these steps for this little piece of wood. Now, if you'll look, it's gonna sit on top of the leg just like that. And that's going to look really sharp. The next step in the process, after we finish the other eight, is to get that square hole drilled in this leg just such that it slips in just like that. All right, that about does it. Now, the whole thing about this square hole is supposed to go in just so, and it is a tight fit, but that's what we're looking for right there. It hides both screw holes and it looks like the through tenon. This is going to be good. When the doors open up, this area will be plainly visible. So we're going to pay a little bit more close attention to this as far as making it look like a real cabinet. Now, we've got their faux leg right here. Now I've got quite a bit of overhang on this side and that's okay because I intend on using a backing strip over here that will scribe to the wall and that comes later. But for right now, I need to bridge this gap right here, which is about a quarter of an inch. So I've taken some stock and I've scribed in on the bottom like this. What I will do is I'll put this in place just like that so that when they are together, it will look like a real leg. And I think this will work out just fine. 
I'm going to attach this with some glue and some one inch pin nails. That's going to work really well. I'm very happy with that. So with this step completed, it's time to focus on the two doors that go here. Now I've taken some careful measurements and I've got a sketch, it's hand sketch, but that's all that's needed. So I have all the stock ready at second dimension. Let's go ahead and take it to final. Remember to mark your boards. You want to make sure you get a good, clean, complete cut. We'll start at the jointer and we will joint the side that we want to keep. On the table saw, we'll remove what we don't, and that will include the sapwood. This is the side I want to keep, and this is the side that the sapwood is on. Note the defect in the bottom. We'll continue jointing this until all defects are gone. The width is 2 and a 16th, and we'll get 2 out of this board. I'm cutting the top rails to length, and I've got them already marked. My saw is calibrated. I just wanted to point one thing out. These tenon joints, they're self-squaring, and they're only self-squaring if they're all the same length. So it's really critical that these all be the same length. So take a good bit of time. Make sure that your cut edge over here is squared up to the highest degree possible, and then clamp it in place. The saw blade has a tendency to move things on the fence, and if you're gang cutting like this, you really need something extra there to hold it down and hold it down solid. The last one is good, but I didn't talk about standard plywood, and I want to. So let me see if I can get through this. If I can't, I'm going to wash it. If not, I get it through, use this one. One, two, three. Well, my rails and styles are all cut to size, final dimension, and things are looking really good, but it's time to start to focus on the joinery. We're going to use what some people would call cope and stick, and generally I think of that being done with a router bit, a matched set. We're not going to do that. We're going to use a table saw and a stacked dado head. In other words, we're cutting dados in the boards and we will cut tenons to fit inside of them. So in this case, we will use, we will cut the dados first. And the panel that we put in here is going to dictate the thickness of those dados. Now this panel right here, it's a quarter inch plus. Plus what? I don't really care. And that's important because I've got a quarter inch dado in my blade and I want a slip fit. So I'm going to sneak up on it and move the fence in. And when I move the fence in, I get a cut that goes through, and that's a quarter of an inch, but it's not centered. When I turn the piece around and move it through, now I have a dado that's a quarter of an inch plus, but it's centered. Now as you scoot that in, you can start to adjust that fit such that it fits your panel. And then you know you've got it. Whatever you do, don't move that fence. You need to get everything cut first. Now, if you're not using this wonderful piece of stock I have here and you're relegated to quarter inch plywood, what do you do? Well, basically you do the same thing, but you don't do it with a stacked dado head cutter. Use your standard saw blade. It's an eighth of an inch. So you cut your cut, turn it around and cut it again. Now you're bigger than an eighth of an inch and you just keep sneaking up on it until you get there. It works very well. This is a technique that makes simple doors very simple. I have taken the scrap piece of wood that I've been using to dial in my dado and I'm going to use it to help me with my tenon. Now I have cut this to the exact same length as this piece here and there's a reason. I want a 3 8 of an inch tenon on the end of that and to do that I have to remove material on either side. So I've taken the time to raise the blade up to the height that I get a good tenon. And I've also moved this stop right here to the outside so that I'm flush against this metal. If you are this way with it, it has a tendency to move in and you don't get a good cut. Fortunately, it's in, you just don't get enough cut. Uh, but I have had it work the other direction. So I've been dialing this in and I have made my mark here for three eighths of an inch and I put my piece, my final piece in here and I'm looking at this making sure that I'm just right but I'm not going to make my cut on this piece. I've got too much time invested in it. I'm going to use this one right here.
Now you might think that's a mistake, but it's not. And now I can test it. Yeah, it's pretty good. Well, I've started some pre-assembly here just to kind of see how things fit and things are looking really good. One thing I'll note about these corner joints is that you really want that tenon to bottom out in the dado. You want it, everything to be tight on the sides because that's what people look at. If this joint isn't tight right here, trim your tenon back a little bit so that it does but not too much because when you look at the top of this you don't want to see a gap now some of my earliest pieces yeah they have a gap and it, it does look a little bush league so tune this in just like I've been showing you to do and things will be great now these particular doors have a center style and that's important thing to note nobody sees anything here so make sure that the tenon right here is just a hair shy It'll do its job once it's glued. I mean, it's not going to go anywhere, but what you don't want it to do is you don't want this one to bottom out. You want the two outside ones to bottom out. This one, not so much. And the reason for that is you don't want it to compete. That's a good way to get your door to be out of square. This one needs to be just a hair shy. Those, right on target. You'll never get another chance to sand these panels down, so do it now before assembly. Also, don't be too aggressive. I was, and my panels were a little loose as a result. It's time for a little assembly, and ordinarily I'd like to be on my workbench, but I've got some cabinets on that. So we've set up a temporary station here, and let's go ahead and get started. I'll move the camera so you can see a little better. We have pre-assembled and we've marked all the boards. We know where everything goes, so if you see me checking, that's why. We want to make sure we get it back the way we wanted it. Now, I'm going to coat each tenon with a little bit of glue. The mortises will leave dry. The first thing we'll do is get that center style into the top and bottom rails. The panels are going to get slid in next, and they don't get any glue at all. Those will float free. When sanding, I was a little too aggressive, and they're sliding in easier than I would typically like, so we will secure those top and bottom with a half inch pin nail. Now it's time to apply some glue to the rail tenons. There's a strict placement for the boards, and we've got to check each time we put a new one in place. That's what's going on here. All right, now this is the first one that you do because it's the one that centers up on those joints. You don't want these tight until that one tightens up. Okay, these look pretty good. Now look at this one. All right. One down, one to go. After a couple hours in the clamps, it's time for final sanding. We won't have to do too much, it was pretty clean to begin with. I've completed the final sanding on the doors and they look great. This came out really nice and this is one of the comments that I wanted to make here about custom furniture. Choose your boards. You can choose your boards and create a whole picture here. For instance, this and this, those are book matched and they're spaced out on purpose. These two are book matched. Those simple book matches pull the whole two doors together in one picture and that's important but it doesn't stop there. We've got this one here same board along the same length so the grain pattern has the illusion of continuing as does this one right here. It all pulls it together. One more. This board and this board are the same spaced out evenly. These, these two are the same as well. So when the finish goes on to this, it's all going to look, it's even going to exacerbate it, or it's going to look like a single piece, a single picture. So you don't really have two doors. You've got one picture right here, and it's a good one. This is, the, this is something about choosing your boards. You can go 
from just plain Jane to very custom, very fast, just by picking your boards, something to consider. Now, what have we gotten done? Well, obviously, we've gotten these two doors done. We've gotten our faux legs done, and these tenons, through tenons, the fake through tenons, look great. That's some complicated joinery, but you know how to do that now. And that pretty much finishes up here. I don't want to cut these tails off until we're ready for fuming, and that is because these tails will take the brunt of any bumps and bruises as we go forward, and inevitably, something hits the floor. It just seems to be the way of things. So we'll keep those there until the last minute. But what are we gonna focus on next episode? Well, just like I need a spacer right here for the hinge, I need some spacers on these for the undermount drawer slides. And we have some leftover maple that we'll work with on that. So we've got to dimension that to thickness. And we'll be working on drawer boxes. I want the drawer boxes done because as soon as these spacers are in, I'm gonna be taping off this oak and we're gonna finish these units. I want to use consolidated lacquer. Lacquer is not considered to be a real durable finish. It goes on fast and it flashes and dries and you can make tracks with it. But if you get pre-consolidated lacquer, they put a chemical in it that actually causes a chemical reaction that makes that lacquer about twice as strong, twice as durable as a standard lacquer finish. And it is really good for cabinetry. The insides of these two units they won't take any abuse. There are drawers in there. And the drawers that are in here, they'll stand up fine to just basic surface, as will the interior to my main, main sink cabinet right there. So pre-consolidated lacquer is actually a really good choice for cabinetry. Now, I'm not gonna put a finish on the oak. We're fuming that. So whatever finish goes on the oak is gonna go on later. And we'll touch on that as we move forward. So, next episode, We've got drawer boxes, undermount drawer slides, and some finish. And I hope to see you there in Roby's workshop.